understated. The, the phone of the subject is turned over to us. We flew that on a GPS plane, plane last night to Quantico. They're in the process of looking at the phone. Unfortunately, at this point in time, we are unable to get into that phone. So it actually highlights an, an issue that you've all heard about before with the advance of the technology and the phones and the encryptions. Law enforcement, whether that's at the state, local, or the federal level, is increasingly not able to get into these phones. So, so I'm not going to describe what phone it is because I don't want to tell every bad guy out there what phone to buy to harass our efforts on trying to find justice here. I can assure you that we're working very hard to get into the phone and that will continue until we find an answer. I don't know how long that's going to be, to be quite honest with you. It could be tomorrow, it could be a week, could be a month. We just don't know yet. But of course it is, if you need help um, and you believe that, um, that you're aware of somebody who might commit this kind of violence, it's very important to engage and call law enforcement um, the FBI and others, there, there are, you know, counterterrorism experts, um, and there is a, a major response infrastructure in place. But we're on the downstream of trying to prevent to us even getting, ideally, to that, that point. I hope everybody in the audience had the epiphany I just did, and I don't know whether you realize how brilliant your answer was, Shelly, but I want to kind of recap that. Because you're absolutely right. We want to make sure that our rights are protected. And even if that means that you're not creating any kind of carbon footprint or footprint for the things that I'm doing on the internet or the things that I'm saying, because you're absolutely right. If I did that, or if we allowed that to be done, then we have given away some of our freedoms, which makes this so extremely difficult. You're absolutely right. Because I don't want to be racially profiled because belong to a certain group. And so because I belong to this certain group, there's going to be this expectation or this um, this belief that I'm going to do something simply because there is a perception that I belong to this group. And so I think the same. I also think you're right when you talk about militarization. We don't want the remedy to this problem to be the militia or having armed guards or the you know the national guard walking our streets because that's not the answer either and because i was really curious and i thought well why would homeland security want to work with a grassroots organization but now i think the light bulb came on for me that's absolutely why you would want to have a grassroots organization using education and nonviolence to combat the other side of this, because you're right, if we gave all these grants to police departments or we gave all these grants to the National Guard, that's not going to educate people. That's just, to me, going to spur more violence in response to violence. And that hasn't worked. And I think we've seen that doesn't work. You know, if you have this extremist group come into town and your only defense at that point is a military zone, you haven't solved anything. You haven't, you haven't educated the people. You just created, I think, another uh, thing that people can put on the internet and say, look how violent they were and look how people were treated. So I don't know if anybody else out there had this aha moment, but I did because I absolutely do want my rights protected and I, I want to be able to have that freedom of thought. But at the same time, there needs to be organizations like Shelly's organization preventing the violence so that we don't have to have these military zones. So just, just brilliant. I don't know if anybody else said that, uh -huh, but, but I did. So what, now we talked about extremism and terrorism. You said domestic versus uh, international when we, when we talk about that. Can you talk about how extremism is similar, same, or, or, or different than terrorism? Yeah, sure. Terrorism is, you know, specific acts. Again, extremism is a sort of broad, terminology we're using. Terrorism is defined. It's illegal. Um, it is when you use unlawful violence for a political or social aim. Um, and it, you know, it, it has that political or social aim. You have to have that aim in place. We're also covering what's called targeted violence. And targeted violence can be violence that happens because of a grievance. You might not want to change a political or social 
overall political or social reality, but you have a deep grievance and you're using violence to address that grievance. So a lot of our mass shootings in schools, for example, um, those students have grievances, uh, those young people have grievances and their shootings um, are driven, uh, you know, they're targeting people in their school, um, they're targeting specific groups to, to address that grievance through violence, might not rise to the level of terrorism, there might not be a political, when you're looking at the motive, there might not be a political or social motive. It's often though becomes clear very soon because of social media and manifestos and other things where there is that political or social um, intention. So you think about the shooting um, in Buffalo, which clearly had a, a racist or what they call racially and ethnically motivated violence. Um, that that was clear that that was the intention of that shooter and went to target uh, those individuals, those people, because they were Black and in a Black space. Um, or El Paso um, in, in Texas, which happened the same evening as the shooting in Dayton did in 2019, that explicitly the shooter had said they were targeting um, uh, local residents of Hispanic or uh, Mexican American descent. Um, so there are targeted violence and overlap with hate crimes and target specific community it, people because of grievances, but not for a overall political and social aim. And then terrorism has that, you have to have that sort of political or social message that you are, are trying to send. And there's domestic terrorism and then there's international terrorism. And as I said before, we're really focused on the domestic targeted violence and terrorism. And it, it does take many different forms. Um, it, it is manifested in many different ways. Uh, and so it's important that people understand these differences, and, but also understand that the phenomenon is driving um, you know, driving a lot of this violence and also a common, um, you know, common characteristic of a lot of this violence is that it's involving guns, right? So uh, that's another issue, like speech, um, in some ways, um, I wanted to mention, you know, in human rights norms, international norms, there is no right to a gun. Um, that's an American constitutional concept coming from our constitution. Um, but the, the right the, to, to carry arms or bear arms that we talk about here domestically doesn't exist internationally. There is no recognition of an international right to have um, a, a weapon. So as a human rights advocate, I make a distinction um, in the United States constitutionally, we could talk about uh, the law and, and those issues, but um, it, the, the rights that are involved in the use of weapons are actually the right to safety and security of the individuals, um, the right to an education, for example, the right to be free and, and uh, in public spaces, um, the right to worship in insecurity. Um, there is no international protection for weapons. And that's a particular thing in the United States and this phenomenon, um, international terrorism is international everywhere, um, but this domestic phenomenon in the United States is specific because of some of those connections. You, you I have a question and I have to, I, I guess, figure out how I'm gonna ask it because you, you have me thinking here and circular, but certainly a question I wanna ask. You say that sometimes some groups will respond violently because of some insult or, or something that they feel that they've been wronged. And we do know that there are marginalized groups in this society that have been wronged and they respond to that insult with violence. How is that similar or the same? Because I'm sure there's somebody in the audience that will say when we look at all the violence that happened after George Floyd, they would have defined that as extremism. What would you say to that? Well, the first thing I would say is that the media and our understanding of the protests after George Floyd and what exactly happened um, 
I think uh, the vast majority and my understanding of the vast majority of protests and protesters um, were were nonviolent. Um, and so you have to look at, at, at specific instances, but of course, there is discourse um, or there is a perception. It's not not true because, as I said before, the vast majority of cases in which people are killed come from right wing extremism. But there are groups in the left wing um, extremist category that are using forms of violence. Um, and those really vary. Uh, some of them are in response. So um, there are specific groups that have decided to arm themselves in the belief that they need to protect um, protesters or other groups from right-wing extremist groups in the United States. So it's a reaction to um, right-wing extremist groups and it's a protection modality. And then there are groups like Antifa, the anti-fascist group that is a big focus for people on uh, the right who do use, uh, you know, block, um, black block sort of methods uh, to protect protesters. They do use um, and develop sort of homemade weaponry. Uh, they're not known for, for their use of particular firearms, um, for example. But uh, clearly, for us, the, the difference between social activism and extremism does lie in sort of how do you use methods of, of nonviolence for social change? Um, and how do you ensure that everyone's rights are protected? Um, we're less concerned about property rights. This is something that groups do end up, you know, um, destroying property or groups on that are for environmental protection, for example, will um, use imagery, destroy. You've seen recent pictures of destroying major art. Um, PETA, you know, PETA yeah, activists. Yeah, right. they destroy so there, there, is, there is obviously use of, and that could be perceived as a form of, you know, aggressive action, of course. But we're really interested and concerned about those who who use violence against other human beings um, and uh, who are looking for social change that, as I mentioned, is about taking away the rights of others, which is about uh, rejecting um, pluralism and acceptance and human rights of others, not around looking for um, greater rights and demanding one's uh, increased rights. Um, because of a clear history of exclusion or injustice. Thank you. I am so glad because I know there was somebody sitting there thinking, aren't they going to talk about Black Lives Matter? But I think you you answered that in an eloquent way, that there are people who are marginalized and they have found a voice and it was a collective voice. And I think that's what made this uh, those marches so different. And because there weren't just Black people out there saying that. I think for the first time that I saw in, in our history, there were just Americans. You couldn't even say just Black people. There were just people out there that thought this was a time in our society where there needed to be change and that people needed to see that there was truly injustices against people that maybe hadn't struck a chord with people before. And so I'm glad you you... We're able to, to discern for individuals that there are differences because part of the ideology and the propaganda was to paint those social, that social activism as violence. And it wasn't many of those protests, most of those protests were nonviolent. So I do appreciate uh, that you were able to discern that. And for anybody in the audience who may feel differently, you can of course have freedom of thought and we respect that, but I, I do appreciate you doing that. Okay, how are these groups funded? Where does the money come from? Because when I see people marching through Charlotte and they've got torches and and they, they even dress for these events, when we talk about the insurrectionists and they're wrapped in flags, who who funded all those bus trips? And and I mean, there had to be money someplace. 
You know, that's a great question and not one that I have a great answer to. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I can, I'm the best place person to answer that. And it's probably a very good um, area for further research. Uh, and it's not something we've looked into in depth. Of course, um, you know, a lot of these groups work in very different ways. So we, in our work, we have looked a lot at Ohio cases um, and they there are very various levels. Some don't require a lot of resources. So if you take the, the you know, the, the sort of recent um, case of the neo-Nazi homeschooling network that we had uh, found in, in Ohio recently, that's um, probably not heavily money intensive and the resources that the families have themselves are what probably gets invested. We are really on the prevention side. Um, we are not on the investigation side. Uh, and I haven't seen a lot on funding when it comes to the, uh, the January 6th uh, investigations and cases that have gone forward. Um, I don't think that has emerged. Uh, but I'll note that, Michelle, and, and come back to you uh, if I find out more. But, but I think what you're saying is, and I think what I'm hearing myself conclude, is that these are just everyday people that have become so radicalized they are potentially using their own resources because they just want to get there and they just want to be a part of it. And you're right. And if social media, because, you know, flash mobs didn't really have a lot of resources. People would just go on a flash mob and say, show up at this place. And thousands of people would show up. And you're right. It took little time, little resource to get people to move. And it's the power of these words that can get people to do just amazing things and I remember looking at the, the footage from the insurrectionist and you can see people just like climbing over other people in race and you think what has motivated and moved these people to behave this way and then you find out the backstories that they're business owners these are attorneys these are doctors these are everyday people that were motivated to do such horrific things because again of an ideology and they wanted and they thought they were the only right people on that day in the country and all the rest of us had it wrong absolutely just fascinating okay so tell me a little bit about prevent ohio and what are you doing because you just educated me about a neo-nazi homeschool yeah the neo-nazi homeschool is yeah. A recent, yeah. So what we're doing is um, work in Southwest Ohio is the remit that we have, what we can reach as the University of Dayton's Human Rights Center. Um, and also, you know, larger cities, Cincinnati and Columbus have many activities coming on, uh, going on or Cleveland. But we're looking at the Dayton and Miami Valley region, and we're focused on prevention, and we're focused on raising awareness, networking, training, um, focusing our community-based efforts uh, on dialogue, for example. And for, um, for us as a university, we also have a student dimension to this. We have courses in which we have integrated modules around media literacy and extremism to enable students to have tools to identify mis and disinformation, to understand how extremists work, what their slogans and symbols are. And then we're also integrating students into our community-based activities. The community-based activities are to catalyze, to set a spark of conversation, both within community groups of vastly different orientations or identities, or um, so that people feel more able to talk about these issues, um, have dialogue to to reach across difference, and to be able to um, you know bring conversations around these difficult issues uh, into their community. And then the other aspect is really working with preventionists. So people in our community who have the ability or in a place where they can identify uh, these risks, fast factors and contribute to a prevention approach. Those are more like 
people who have a particular role in a community, like um, religious leaders or people who work on suicide prevention or sexual violence prevention, alcohol and drug prevention, uh, first responders, obviously law enforcement, it is in there as well, teachers, um, school prevention. So we're really looking at those people in our community who who can help um, identify and prevent, as well as just regular community groups who need to be aware and be discussing these issues, figuring out and and identifying why we're so polarized, managing, um, you know, and talking about how we manage our interactions and our relationships how we talk about difficult issues in our society in a way that leads to nonviolent resolution of some of these issues. Well, Shelly, when I heard about your work, I certainly uh, wanted to use our platform to be able to just educate and inform. And, and I feel inspired and I feel fortunate that I live in a community because there weren't a lot of communities who got those grants, everybody. So the fact that I live in a community that you were forward thinking enough to say, this is important. This is important for us to be able to protect on a grassroots level, I think is absolutely brilliant. So like I tell everybody, if you've had the aha moment I have, this isn't a law enforcement initiative. And, and that to me says that somebody's getting it right, that you're really trying to use a grassroots approach to educate people about what is fact and what is fiction and how dangerous some of this ideology is. I could keep you on here all day, Shelly, but I'm, <laughs> I do, I want to respect your time. But I always give my guests the last word. What do you think is important for people to know about your organization? How do they get in touch with you? And I'll certainly put your information up here if they want to help, you know, if they want to uh, have a speaker or something come out. Um, what do you want to leave our audience with? Yeah, I mean, I, I thank you so much, Michelle, for having us. I hope people reach out we have ways to get involved both in dialogue and in trainings on these issues. So if you are interested, please reach out to the Human Rights Center at the University of Dayton. And hopefully, Michelle, you can um, give our you know, email and contacts. Uh, I think it's important in terms of your, your work and your community um, just to talk about how critical faith-based communities like the University of Dayton or Catholic Marianist uh, University how important that this conversation take place um, in faith-based groups and communities, how essential it is that we understand, um, you know, how interfaith dialogue and acceptance, and also reject um, concepts that equate patriotism and Christianity, for example, with white Christian nationalism, where we really um, are able to differentiate that we people can have um, strong, you know, religious and other views, um, and and be patriotic without being um, nationalist, exclusionary, and in fact that we are intended to expand, um, and that faith based communities are intended to expand the remit of acceptance um, and engagement and inclusion. So I I think it's just important that everybody talk about these issues, that we feel comfortable, that we're not feeling uncomfortable um, engaging with them, uh, and that in Southwest Ohio, we do realize that, uh, you know, it's here, that this is in our community, um, that this is not just a national phenomenon, it's not just a shooting in this place or that place, this is about um, us, and we use a lot of cases from Ohio um, and a lot of facts about Ohio so that people understand that that we're all responsible for addressing this and that this is something that impacts us all. Well, I can certainly tell, Shelly, you are passionate about this, and I appreciate you coming on Tab Talks. You are doing some powerful work, and I think you're, you're right. The faith-based community, we can't sit this one out. I mean, we see uh, people dying in the streets uh, and we see people that are being misled by what they believe uh, to be the right thing to do. And it, and it clearly isn't when you start comparing, you said that there's only one way 
uh, to salvation and that's through violence. I, I don't see that there's any correlation between those two things. And I appreciate you unpacking this very uh, complex topic. It's, it's a lot deeper than I even realized. And I, I appreciate you coming on Tap Talks. Thanks, Michelle. It's been a powerful message to us. And I think if you guys are unfamiliar with their work, I'm gonna put their information up here so you can contact them directly. <laughs>